Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Lee of Love Them Knives. Lee started his super popular YouTube channel in 2016 with an obvious passion that any knife junkie will recognize. His exploration of a broad range of folding knives and the ever-growing collection of knives with corresponding videos on his channel uh, necessitated monthly knife sales to keep the new knives coming in and the new content going out. Lee's lifelong uh, knack for buying and selling knives is now a legit business that many of us are going to want to become familiar with for both buying and selling. We'll talk all about LTK's life in knives and his new website. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share this uh, with a friend, a like-minded individual. Also, you can download the show to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you want to help support the show and get exclusive uh, content like uh, extra interview time with someone like Lee, for instance, go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Lee, welcome to the show. Hey, it's good to be here. Hey, uh, I want to congratulate you on the Love Them Knives website. Uh, before we started rolling, I was telling you how, how beautiful I think it is. Yeah, um, I think it turned out pretty well. Uh, it's been kind of a long track, it's something that should have happened uh, two or three years ago, but it uh, just uh, came up on July third, I think was the day I actually uh, went live with it. And uh, it's doing well. It's doing well. Uh, I so, have no doubt. I have no doubt it is and will be because of the presentation. I want to get to all of that. But as you mentioned, it was a uh, 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 quite a uh, an arduous path to get there. And I want to I want to find out about what that was all about and uh, find out about your life in knives. You know, I was on your website and I saw the about section and you tell a really cool story about how you first got into knives. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I mean, back when I was very young, uh, we moved into a house. I mean, I was probably six or seven years old. We moved into a house and in the basement, I found a little knife with an acrylic handle on it. Uh, scale on one side no scale on the other that was the first little knife i found in the basement which those days they didn't have a finished basement in the house so you just uh that was for you know where canned goods you do or root cellar that kind of thing but i found that and that was fascinating the next thing was just a few years later when my father and i went down to the local sporting goods store and he bought a buck 110. I've still got that knife. I've still got the little acrylic knife. And uh, so the buck 110 was awesome. You know, that counter display with the buck knife being hammered through a nail, you know, because it was whatever it was back then. I'm not sure it was, it might have been 440 back then or 420 mm -hmm. steel back in those days. But, uh, you know, they were they were bragging about how tough that blade is, and uh, it was impressive. And, uh, yeah, that kind of gave me the bug. Uh, and it really, after that, it wasn't till I was mm, out of college and doing my thing in the corporate insurance thing, and I, I would go to this little sporting goods store uh, and that was one of my favorite places to go whenever I went over to Oklahoma City to visit clients and stuff. And I'd go in there and they had Spyderco, mm -hmm. Sog, you know, that kind of thing. And Benchmade, those knives. And uh, so, I mean, I started with like the Sog Tomcat and oh, yeah. even the gun and knife shows they had in Tulsa where I was living, the Wanamaker, big, huge gun and knife shows. And I bought an a civilian that got the tip kind of 
bent a little bit and it it had that rubber grips on it and the G2 steel blade or something like that. Uh, it, it, you know, that kind of thing. And then they had a lot of handmade knives and I got to know several guys that were making handmade knives. And Bill Coghill was one, but Newt Livesey out of Arkansas and some others. So it reinvigorated my my knife thing. So, and then I started getting into Almar knives, and mm. I thought maybe I wanted to sell knives, and uh, and that's a really really bad idea to try and compete, especially today with in retail brand new knives as a knife dealer. Uh, I don't even know how the brick and mortar places make it myself, but no, I have no desire to get into brand new knives. I have the, the, the website, which is, you know, consignment knives. And yeah. so the good thing about consignment knives is there's no other knife exactly like that knife. I mean, that yeah. knife has its own individual price. It has its own individual history. A lot of them on my site were taken out of the box, flipped, admired, put back in the box, you know? Yeah. And there's some, there's some that saw use, you know? So I've got the the whole spectrum on my website. Well, you know, I noticed, uh, well, you have a custom Bowie that I would love to own. Uh, a little bit out of my range on that site. Uh, not too many fixed blades, but uh, but you still I put have... some in there just recently, like yeah. the Carruthers Field Duty oh, yeah. uh, F, F, FD2 or whatever it was, field grade FG2. Uh, God, CPM 3B, of course, yeah. made in the USA with the deep red micarta. And then, you know, uh, the Bussy, Light Brigade. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gemini. Uh, that's a beautiful knife, but you know what? They've just been sitting on my shelf for a couple of years and, uh, mama wanted new countertops. So there they go. <laughs> there they go. There well, they go. The, the, the range is wide is what I'm getting at. Uh, you have everything from, uh, you know, $30 Civivis to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. expensive uh, fixed blade knives and, and everything uh, in between, but you also have, um, like I said, uh, custom, but also, uh, modified. I saw a bunch of cold steels on there that have been, uh, some really heavily modified, uh, <laughs> and they're interesting, man. Uh, if, if the nothing same else, guy there. sent them in, same yeah. guy sent a bunch of cold steels in and that guy could not leave his knives alone. And I no. don't know, but maybe he was a former ranger or special forces or something. <laughs> Because holy cannolis, uh, he reground blades. He uh, he uh, yeah. put the apocalyptic finish on them, and uh, some kind of uh, friction tape or something on them. Whoa, they're they're ready to go. They're set up and ready to go. They're not for the the showcase, and they right. definitely are not factory. Not for the faint of heart. Uh, I, I want to, uh, before we dig too far into the website, I want to back up to this experience you mentioned about being at the uh, sporting goods store with the Buck 110. Um, the the Buck displays uh, back when I was a kid in the 70s and 80s were, um, man, they got me. The shape of the, of the 110 blade, the shape of the uh, 119, you know, the hunter that was always at the hardware store too. Um, they really captured my imagination that that extreme bowie shape with that deep clip uh just i don't know reminded me of what i was seeing maybe on tv when i was a kid and they looked like pirate knives they really uh man they got to me yeah and you know what i like the kalinga too with that big you know yes, trailing yes. point the yeah. persian kind of swept blade look i thought that was just way cool yeah, so I, I like to see uh, that Buck has begun to, I don't know, um, spiff things up. You know, they have their Buck of the Month. They have different ways of of getting into their designs if you like higher-end materials and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, as, as you moved out of the, um, well, how did you move into your modern era of collecting? You know, you were talking about the SOGs, and then you got into Almar, which for a time were exclusive, awesome 
Japanese made knives. Yeah, um, they're crazy expensive now, but you know, back when he was alive, yeah, um, they were reasonable, I guess, by today's standards, you know, but yeah. no, no longer. And you know what? They're a bit outdated as far as blade steels and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, you had the Hobbit Warrior that uh, oh, Bob yeah. Taylor did. Yeah, it called Recat Knives. And uh, so it was Ra Round Eye Knife and Tool Company. And he named it that because the Japanese were making the stuff for Almar and et cetera. And, and he wanted to make that warrior buoy only smaller, easier to carry, lighter, really more practical. And then they say, Round Eye can't make that knife because the US didn't have manufacturing sophistication like the Japanese at that time. At least that's what they thought. So in jest, I mean, I, I'm sure tongue in cheek, he named it Round Eye Knife and Tool, oh. which was free cat. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. I had one that he oh. sold with limited edition that way he did at the Soldier of Fortune uh, convention. This this was a, a really cool design that actually Spiderco ended up picking up and doing for a while. Um, this this is the curved yeah. the upswept yeah, blade. Yeah, with, yeah, yeah. With the with the spine I had that serrated. one for a while, and I'm thinking about going around and going, you know, secondary market just just to find one and uh, pick one up again. I had one, came and went, came and went. But talking about yeah, talking I, about I, vintage Spider Co, check that out. I mean, this ooh, um, yeah. This That's is the, the Takuma Tatanka. Tatanka, which is uh, oh, yeah. Native American, I think is the Lakota word for buffalo, but Tatanka. So VG10 made in Japan. And oh, I think we got Lawrence Fishburn here uh, <laughs> with the, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, this was like a Bony Buddies uh, the one I got from uh, somewhere in Europe. But yeah, I mean, the Tatanka. Almost 12 inches long, five inch blade. So, uh, so what was the there was something special about the lock on the Tatanka? What was it? No, it's no, it's just a back lock, I think. Uh well, what do they call that? The boye dent or whatever they call that for yeah. the for the lock. It, I but thought no. that had something special in the lock back that if made they it extra. do then yeah, you might be right because figure this out. See how oh, yeah. okay, let me move. Yeah. See how that lock works, you yeah. know, and I've forgotten more than I remember. <laughs> how cool is that, so, though? Uh, so uh, how did it how did it come to be that? Well, let's talk about your channel. 2016, you start your channel. And uh, this uh, I mean, we also know that by now you've also been buying and selling knives kind of your whole life just for fun as a hobby. But you start this channel. Uh, why did you start the channel and what was your mission when you started? Well, I mean, after I had my bout with cancer and then I was on a uh, disability uh, and I didn't have a job, um, but I had, you know, I had some commercial disability policy that was paying me and I didn't really need to work, uh, but uh, I was getting on my, on my Harley and going bar hopping and uh, uh, drinking too much and hanging out at this and that and running with the guys. And uh, my wife says, uh, you need a hobby. I mean, and uh, so she says, you like knives. Why don't you, she talked to my niece, I think. And my niece at the time, I swear to God, was like 10 years old, 11 years old, 10 or 11. And she had already started a YouTube channel teaching women how to do makeup. Oh, cool. I mean, what? And, and she was saying, well, there's people that actually can make some income by doing that as well. But my wife was just looking for me to try and get engaged with something. And I ain't no good at word working or whatever. So I, she wasn't going to buy me a bass boat. So, no, I, I, I just lined up the camera to the table. Maybe some of the guys out there will remember the orange tablecloth on the on the utility table oh, and uh, some cheap lights that I got. Um, and that was it. Um, 
And so I started doing videos. And so the rest is history. But you know what? I learned a lot by doing those videos. And I had to go the slow, you know, bump my head every inch of the way, kind of. I didn't have a lot of people giving me pointers or instruction. And so I learned that I had the wrong lighting, uh, that my background was a little bit more important than an orange tablecloth. And, uh, and, you know, just kind of how to set things up correctly. And then... I learned a lot about knives. Um, I know I wasn't hip to a lot of the stuff, the walker lock and all that kind of stuff. Um, it was only about two years before I started my channel, I even knew what a Sabenza was, you know? Uh, so yeah, I had a lot of catching up to do. Well, that's a great way to do it because you take people uh, on the trip with you um, because yeah. I, uh, I I contest that people keep tuning in to uh, knife channels, and I'm sure all channels, but knife channels because they like the people behind the camera, you know, and they just want to hear that person, what that person's thinking, uh, maybe about a given knife, or just maybe they just want to hear their voice because they like their sense of humor or whatever it is. Um, Are you talking about me? <laughs> you talking yeah, about me? yeah, and 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 uh, I think that that's uh, that's cool, and and. And people are forgiving. They don't expect you to know everything as long as you don't come off as a know-it-all. And then they'll come <laughs> along with you and they'll learn with you and they'll help you too, help you understand. Uh, that's a great thing about the live shows is getting live, uh, you know, having live conversation with um, with viewers. Yeah, I just don't do much live stuff anymore. I've only done like a couple of live feeds in forever. And yeah, I need to do more of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just get busy with the website. And then uh, I'm trying to try and somewhat stay up on some of the new knives that are coming out. And it's almost impossible. Uh, yeah. There is so much out there, especially with so many guys that are now knife designers. Yeah. And I, you know what? I don't even have my Devo. Uh, I don't even have my Devo v, v version two. Uh, okay. Growler? No. Yeah, I don't have my Growler version two. I just put it up on my Instagram the other day. Uh, but <clears throat> yeah, I mean, Devo knives. And of course, Sharp by Design. I mean, Brian, I mean, custom knife maker, but then doing his production line and just. I mean, Arcane Designs, Damn Designs, I mean, on and on and on. A lot of guys in the U.S. now OEMing knives, and a lot of them had never made a knife, but they designed. And that's okay, because there's yeah. people that never made clothing, but they're clothing designers, and they have their designs made. Okay. So, I mean, that's okay. That's a legitimate thing, is to be a designer, not a craftsman, necessarily. Uh, but uh, that, I mean, just to keep up with that. And not mentioning all the knife manufacturers that are yeah. now making knives and new ones coming into the market all the time. And such a hard thing is uh, how high the quality is of all of these knives, almost all of them. Uh, unfortunately, some of the legacy brands have fallen behind, uh, but these knives that it's like a new one pops up every quarter you'll see a new company uh, out of china that's making exquisite knives and who knows maybe all along they were making some of the other knives that we love and we just didn't know it yeah um and here's an example is uh venom knives and i got this one from weeby knives san francisco and uh so he tends to get some of these that you can only find on like DHgate, AliExpress. I mean, they really aren't uh, available in the US necessarily, but um, Venom Knives, Kevin John Venom Knives, uh, the new concept was available on Blade HQ at one time. You can go back and look at that. The, what was it? The Venom Attacker was renamed the Deboia and sold by CKF. Hmm. So it was same. Uh, Kevin John Venom, and these are these are cool. This is the Maverick, and so I'm gonna be working on this because I think I just about dislodged the uh, detent ball 
Oh. It, <laughs> it won't drop past that, and then I have to push it shut. So I think I think I've done done it. I think I dropped it, almost hit the concrete, but the butt may have hit, and it may have almost partially. I I'll, I'll get into it, but oh. yeah, what's drop shutty? It ain't now. So <laughs> ain't. damn it, I was ain't. so pissed when that happened, but. Whatever. I sent it out for testing. Yes, it's a real M390, and the Rockwell was like 60 on it. So, oh, nice. And that's another thing. You learn a lot about blade steels. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. one uh, in particular, where's my where's my Chad? Uh, oh, it's over here. Yeah. And so this is a nice one from Kun Wu. And Kun Wu is really getting a name for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And that this is, is the Chad, and this is that steel that's supposed to be 63 to 66 Rockwell. And I keep forgetting the name of the steel on here, and I'll have to look on the blade. But it's fascinating because, uh, and if I can see, it's the PM60. So PM60 steel, look that up. It's uh, This is crazy. And they had been talking to my buddy Roman, who is in Switzerland, who's been doing a lot of custom, uh, you know, Rockwell runs and working with Bowler on different things. And uh, so they got interested in actually really paying attention to the steel. Uh, nice. And they're not the only ones, but it's interesting that, you know, some of these companies that just make a lot of knives and you don't know you know, how much attention are they paying to doing the correct yeah. heat treating? So I think that's going to be another thing that's going to come around, not just different designs, really flawless manufacturing, but also paying attention to the, the details. Yeah, I feel like uh, the past couple of uh, years were about action, and then locks, you know, <clears throat> button lock and access bar lock. You know, once uh, once the crossbar lock was no longer under patent, you know, as the access lock, people ah. kind of went crazy with that. But then they really went crazy with the button lock. I think people have. Uh, I think. I think the fidget just like might... the LTK result. I just had to do it in a button lock. The good thing though is that We Knives does a really good job with the button lock and. Mine was really, before they were really doing much button lock stuff with Wee Knives, I had this under production and they're the OEM on it. But, you know, okay, since then they have come out with that. So let, let's talk about this. Cause I hadn't, I haven't mentioned this yet. You are also a designer, as you mentioned. Uh, yeah. Uh, a lot of enthusiasts out there are designing knives. You have two in production and I say- No, just um, one. Oh, one. Yeah, the uh, other one was actually I was a co-designer with uh, with Max over in uh, Ukraine on the Vandal, but the Vandal wasn't mine. It was a it was a Tucson knife. It says Tucson on it, gotcha, and gotcha. it's a Tucson knife. But we, I mean, I started off just asking the owner of Tucson, "Hey, if I did a design, would you look at maybe making it?" If it was decent, and he goes, yeah, sure. And so uh, uh, Max and I whipped this one up, and we called it the Bandle. We probably we went back and forth quite a while on on the name, but I, th I when he came up with Bandle, I go, yeah, absolutely, ruffian, no, Bandle. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. it was good. So yeah. Well, I mean, okay, in my book, I so still this is actually under yours. my name. So oh, I am the I knife company on this one. So it's got you. the result, and my wife named it. And I was thinking about names, like what? Oh, geez. And Max helped me on this one too. He would do some of the two dimensional and three dimensional drawings on it, and then when I wanted to do, you know, inserts and stuff in the scales, then he came up with several different patterns of how we could do that and so how, how did this project arise and how did you uh, go about getting it uh manufactured um i i you know i just thought it would be interesting to come up with uh, a design and i already had some ideas in my head of like blade shape 
and general form on the knife um, that I wanted. And maybe it's kind of reflected both in this one and this one. Mm -hmm. I mean, the blades are not all that different. Yeah. The handles are. The size definitely is. But this was kind of this all-purpose utilitarian knife. I wanted to make it simple. I didn't, you know, and of course, you have to make uh, compromises because, you know, if I did it just for me, it'd be bigger. But then it, you know, then it would turn a lot of guys off. Yeah. So three and a half inch blade, that's good. Eight inches overall, that's good. And four and a half ounces, that's fine. And so from there, you know, did I, I wanted multi row bearings. No, there's no way to squeeze them in. But I mean, and I keep flicking it, but it's it's got a flipper tech. But you know, just kind of a general design of a knife that can do piercing, slicing. Uh, I didn't want it to be very expensive. Some of these knives now that are OEM'd from USA guys are hitting five, six hundred dollars, mm. especially with, with the Moku Tai kits and right. you know this and that. So I didn't want it to be that. So what do you have uh, it priced at? It's two forty five, and and then there's a ten percent discount by using LTK. So it ends up oh. at two hundred and twenty dollars. And I think oh, uh, White Mountain Knives now has a free Kubi knife you get if you buy one of these. So uh, oh, nice. there's that. So they've got that. This is in a maroon, and then you can also get it with the green inserts instead of the maroon. So comes either way. I'm a big sucker for maroon handled knives. It's like my favorite color. Um, what? Yeah. Uh, who did you have make that? Is that something you talk about? Oh, we knives. We, we knives. knives. Oh, you mentioned that mm -hmm. before. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's right. We knives uh, uh, has done some OEM stuff in the past that I've um, that I have in my collection, uh, but I haven't gotten a new we knife in a little while. But um, I've gotten tons of Civivis and Zonda. And the man, I nice. love them. This just came out recently, but I have the Ziphius mm. that I'm going to keep. But this one um, is really nice. It's not uh, the I'd say the Ziphius and the Exciton are some of the best knives they've come out with in several years. And this one ain't far off either. The Zonda is not far off. It's it's pretty nice. Slender is a good size knife, though. So. This may not be everybody's cup of tea. Well, what's your wheelhouse? What What do you consider a great knife, and what's what are your parameters? Um, you know, I guess I like I like G10 knives because the the scale material is really really durable. I mean, the problem with titanium is you can get snail trails on it real easy, and then it's very obvious, and there's really no good way to fix that. Um, and, you know, it depends. I mean, I don't mind a small knife, uh, and there's a lot of knives that are laying around my house that I use that are small and lightweight, and they're just laying here and there, so they're within easy grasp because I've got packages going out. I got packages coming in. I got cutting chores to do. I got boxes to tear down. And so, yeah. And so, no, I'm not going to take, holy shit. I'm not going to take, oh God, I didn't cut this loose. The Terminator. I'm not going to take the T-1000 to do that, even though that'd get the job done. I'll end up with something more like this. And this is the good boy by Best Techman. So you got a 40 something dollar shooter with this is AR RPM nine, I believe, steel. But no, no, it's not. It I can't remember. I think it's 9 CR18. I can't remember for sure. But you know, best techman. This yeah. is a good boy. This is a full size, nice flat grind, easy to use. And you know what? If something happens to it, it's no big deal. So, yeah, I mean, I really use, here's a little SRM knife. I mean, see, okay, Lee, move. Lee, this, this is the thing that, that grinds in my gut is I, I have a whole bunch of knives. I love everything from the, the cheap, cheap to the expensive. Uh, and yeah. I have all these super capable, expensive knives, 
but I always reach for the cheap ones for the breaking down cardboard and what have you. That grinds in my gut. But, you know, the good thing is on user steals like D2 or 9CR18 or OS10 or whatever, I mean, they're a lot easier to strop back up. I mean, it's like you make them butter knife, then you got to get out the sharpener. But, I mean, if, if you just cut a while with them and you can tell you've lost some, you can strop them back. And it's a lot easier than if you've got, you know, a knife with a super steel because then you got to get the diamond stones out. And then you got a little bit more work to do because it's harder steel. Uh, so I tend to just use the less expensive blades with a, a user steel for, for round the house stuff. So these are pretty. I love to look at them mm -hmm. and dream about how wild they are and because they're crazy knives. But uh, what I actually use are probably be more like in tune with this kind of thing around the house. And it's a hell of a lot lighter and easier to carry too. So, so you know, you know what I find really um, uh, well. It, it warms my heart a little bit is that you can go to Lowe's or Home Depot now and get a pocket knife, and it's not going to be of with great materials and that kind of thing, but it'll be inexpensive, and you will get uh, action that you could only find on a custom knife ten years ago. You'll get ball bearing action on a cheap knife. You'll get some of the hallmarks. Uh, uh, that knife collectors like in modern folders. I, I like that it has sort of filtered all the way down through the through the knife culture to say Home Depot. Yeah, it has. But you know, like assisted opening knives. I mean, I'm not a big fan of them, but uh, I, the working Joe, they mm -hmm. think that's cool because it's kind of like an automatic. You know, yep. it just pops open when you start going. And you know, for a lot of those guys it might be a preferred way to, to go. Um, and it's wild that, you know, ZT, even on a couple of their models, they had assisted opening. Yeah. Even on some of their early models, I think like the 300, no, not the 300, uh, one of those models in the 300 series yep, the was 566. assisted opening. Yeah, yep. I mean, but you know, like you were talking about the, the the knife companies that everybody would chase like seven or eight years ago, that they've kind of really just stopped. Uh, ZT's an example. Yeah. I mean, what happened to ZT? I loved them. I've got three or four of them from the olden days. Yeah. And but nothing all that new. I mean, the hinderer slicer uh, all uh, tie. Um, is the latest one that I just it's so old. And... I mean, it's a great knife, but that's been around <sighs> forever. Uh, and, and that's fine. That's fine. But I, I, I feel like zero tolerance right now uh, is in a position where if, if they're still operating, they need to get on it like now more than ever uh, for, <laughs> and maybe, maybe uh, be an example to the rest of uh, the U S companies. I know that there are OEMs that are, coming along in the United States. Uh, but we need more of that highly refined folder making in the United States. You know, and I talked to, I'm not going to mention his name, but he's a custom knife maker and he's had a couple of his knives uh, collaborative his designs done by Cancept. And he, he got a backer to back him to start doing a production line uh, uh, you know, come up with a design and have it produced. Uh, and uh, they went looking, they went shopping for a USA mm -hmm. manufacturer. I could tell you the story, but I don't want to throw names out, but they went to a certain manufacturer and they just go, nah, it'll be two years and it'll cost you $110,000 or something like that. And he goes, I got the money, um, but I don't think that's going to be good because two years from now, God only knows what people will be chasing. I got to have the thing in production quicker than that. And uh, then they turned around, even though he tried to overcome their objections, then they just said, you're just not, you're not as known as uh, others. And so, yeah, I don't think we're going to do it anyhow. 
So I mean, oh, but he chased some different. Yeah. He just chased some different people, and uh, yeah. oh, wow, that that was that was sad. Um, yeah. And so yeah. the problem is, who in the U.S. is doing the OEM work? And and here's the problem: if you got the machinery and the expertise to be able to do that, you're not going to do that because the money you get per machine hour for doing other things like aircraft parts or high tech yeah. parts and things like that, it pays better. See, knives don't pay that well. And knives are easy to make now. I mean, because the machinery is so sophisticated, you can make knives, but do you want to? No, no, it doesn't pay. So yeah. they don't want to do it here. And so China is the place because they've got, you know, they've got machinery out the wazoo and they've got the expertise to be able to do it, unfortunately. So, I mean, as much as people want to and everybody's concerned about China, but I mean, uh, they're doing the work and why we can't have some of that back in the States. I don't know. I mean, it's I mean, they do graduate armies of engineers every year. I, I think uh, more than we have yeah. in our entire country every year. I mean, uh, so they have uh, <laughs> well, they have a lot of humanity and a lot of machinery. And uh, I, I feel like uh, the, the OEM thing could work here with fixed blades if, uh, uh, if, if people care uh, to try. I, I know fixed blades are, um, uh, well, EDC fixed blades are coming along and they're, and they're, you know, they're they're slowly gaining popularity. I love, I carry fixed blades every day, pretty much. Um, that would be easier to OEM because there's way less engineering that goes into it. And once you have uh, things, you know, things going as far as your fixtures and that kind of thing are concerned, it's less complex. The building a modern folder and what we've come to expect, even from a forty dollar flipper that we get off Amazon. Man, that that takes some doing. Yeah, and you know it's amazing. There was a guy that made a comment uh, on one of my videos, uh, send cut videos today, going, "Wow, I got that." I think it was a Watagua or something. And he he said, "I got it," and in ten minutes, it was my favorite folder because it was just drop shutty out of the box. I think that's a button lock model as well. And you know what? I I you can laugh at me, but I'm going to pass up a bunch of the tables selling three or four hundred dollar knives, and I go to Sencat and I say, "What do you?" When I go to like Atlanta or whatever, what do you got? Because you can buy, you know, three or four knives for under two hundred bucks. I mean, yeah. these are like forty four dollars a knife, and you know, even some of them since have discontinued or something, and some of the Savivi ones, and they're like thirty nine dollars or something. That's a hell of a good user knife. And another guy was making a comment about the sub budget uh, knives that are like $20 to 25, even below $30. Uh, a lot of those are surprisingly yeah. good too. Like the CH I mean, knives and isn't the that nuts? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is pretty crazy. Not only that, but uh, the send cut, <clears throat> excuse me, send cuts and CJRBs and Civivis and the sort of uh, down budget brands or high value brands, if you will, are more willing to take chances and and trial balloon some designs there that might end up in we or I, I know they they kind of sometimes do that in reverse, like they did with the what Watuga and the. Um, the one you were just talking about, uh, the Ziphius, uh, kind of very mm -hmm. similar knives. They started with the Ziphius, but but frequently you'll see them kind of test ideas in the less expensive lines. So you get more uh, interesting stuff coming out of there in a way. Yeah. I mean, uh, July was incredible for Savivi. They came out with some really that Sentry or whatever that was. Um, oh, yes. Sentinel Strike. It's like Sentinel in my Strike. pocket. All the time, Ooh. all the time. I wow. love Wow, and you know what? It was kind of a Ziphius thing. Yeah. You know, that's what I thought of when I saw it. And then, of course, the FG, the Vision FG. Yeah. 
Yeah, taking yeah. that next design. So now that Jim has your website up, I want to I want to jump back to this because I want to get to the the genesis of this. Um, at some point, you're uh, you're doing your channel. You have a lot of knives coming in for all the content that's going out. There's that that bussy there. Oof. You got all this <laughs> this uh, content going out. All these knives coming in. Uh, how did it begin that you started doing a monthly knife sale and how did that grow? Uh, you know, I think my monthly knife sales uh, must have started. I, I, I thought about that, too. Um, when did I start that? Um, and I think it might have been within six months of starting my channel um, because I was I was buying knives and then uh, you know, you're. At some point in time, uh, you're you've got a lot of money tied up in knives, and you know, and I was selling them on eBay. I mean, I've got an eBay seller, you know, name and everything, and uh, <clears throat> I've got I don't know hundreds of transactions on that because I sold, you know, years ago too. But uh, I go, why don't I? I think I saw somebody else like Apostle P or whoever doing a, a weekly knife sale on his. And uh, I thought that way I could bypass all the fees like on eBay. And woo, I mean, it's even worse now. So I go, I can sell my own knives that I want to turn over on my own channel and not have to pay all those fees. So I, I started doing that. And then uh, my buddy Larry over in Arkansas, he, he, he was a regular viewer on my channel. He goes, I got some knives I'd like to sell too. And then this, that started. And then there were other guys that wanted to. And I started doing like a, two knife sales, um, one for the early birds. And they could sign up on the list for free. And if I had their name, then I would just send out this mass uh, uh, email and they could, I can't remember even how I did that, but I would do one for them early and then I'd do the regular public. And then it was years later before I even started my Patreon channel. So now I actually do an early bird uh, for my Patreons uh on the website even okay so i've got a special access that's hidden from the normal viewer but uh i do the drop to the patreon channel for that uh 48 hours before it, it i i make it visible for the public uh but back when i was doing the youtube sales i also made that uh, a benefit of my Patreons to be able to get in on the early bird sales. Mm -hmm. And they loved it. I mean, they they weren't on my Patreon channel because they just loved those videos so much. <laughs> they wanted to get on there because they were interested in what the hell's hitting and that I want to get in on because there were some pretty classic stuff and discontinued, hard to find, and or just priced really well. Yeah. And so they loved it. Um, and so I continue that for my Patreon channel today. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and so I've got, you know, maybe 120 guys on the Patreon and they're happy. And now I'm doing a weekly forum because I'm not going to get nine boxes of knives in from people that want to go on my website and sit there and hold them for very long. So I just take what I got for the week, put them on the website under a hidden thing and then i release that to the patreon group so they can check it out and then nice. boom you know a day and a half later or whatever i i pop it public and let it go so yeah well how That's long were you doing. how how long were you doing the um the youtube sales before you decided let's oh, just shit. make this a business like a youtube uh, make a website six years six years yeah i've done my channel for a little over seven right yeah, that makes right. Uh, 16, yeah, four and three, right? So, yeah, seven years. And so, yeah, I was starting to do the YouTube sales six months in. So probably six and a half months or, or six and a half years or maybe now coming up close on seven years that I've been doing the nice sales. And it just was a lot of manual tracking everything, uh, you know, 
because I would just do it on my iPad Pro or something. I'd have it in my notes section. I'd have a separate sheet for every person that sent knives in with their list of knives and their pricing, and I'd know who was who. But doing the reconciliations and all that without any software help and stuff was crazy. So now, oh, I got it set up to where it's a lot easier. Yeah. You're all squared away with that. Well, <clears throat> what are you seeing uh, is, uh, and not necessarily just from your website, but just in your experience, what are people buying right now? And what are the trends that, that are hot right now that you think will have legs? Uh, tell you the truth, I think the market's kind of soft and uh, sales, I think, are down a bit. Uh, I think there's, uh, yeah, it wasn't as, it was really strong during the COVID stuff. People were at home, they were getting checks from the government, this and this and this. And now, you know, I've heard this from the, from guys who have websites um, and from retailers. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not as, it's not as active now. And I don't know, you know, hot summer, people on vacation. Now that kids are getting back in school, maybe we'll see it picks up a bit. But yeah, but what has legs? Uh, good designs. I think right now, a lot of the manufacturers have honed in on the fact that you don't want to make them too big. Uh, you want to man, so it's getting a little monotonous with some of the makers. You can guarantee it's like 3.48 inch blade with like yeah. eight inches, 8.1, 8.2 overall length and under, under, because, um, uh, you know, a lot of three inch at 3.2 inch blades. Uh, and I understand uh, lighter weight, smaller knives are easy to carry. I think there's a bigger audience for that. So I think that's got legs. I think that um, I don't know how long the button lock trend will be out there. Some people are already getting a little button lock burnout. Um, I, I've got a little bit of a frame lock burnout myself. I mm. kind of am more likely to want bolster locks as opposed to a full frame lock. I mean, where they got an inlay on the back that hides that lock bar. And so you can just see about that much of it as it comes up on the pivot. Um, and so that's okay. I mean, that's kind of like this, right? The Mystic from Kaiser, Paul Monko design. I mean, so you got, and I can't even put, uh, I'm, everything's backwards. Okay, so yeah. So this is, this is nice. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it run all the way back here. I'm and with you. So, I'm with you because yeah. the, the 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 ease of opening from Maverick a bolster lock. the same way bolster lock up here you know like the Maverick so I, that's why I like inlay on both sides if you're going to do it do it on both sides don't do a half and half uh, half and half leave that in the refrigerator put it in your coffee <laughs> what about slip Hell joints there, there's there's been a a resurgence in slip joints for at least the past ten years kind of with GEC but but in the last couple of years with uh, higher, uh, you know, manufacturing, uh, not higher end than GEC, but a different sort of modernized manufacturing. Uh, what do you think about those? I like them. And Jack Wolf is huge, right? Oh, yeah. Jack Wolf just exploded. I mean, what, two, three years ago? Didn't know anything about Less. them. Now they yeah. got like 12, 13 models out. Yep. And was it the Gunslinger? Was that the one? Yeah. It was a yep. flipper? The bolster and lock? I, I love it. I, I see. I like the gunslinger, so I like a knife that looks traditional but can be like real super fidget friendly. But no, I do like traditional slip joints, and you know probably about traditionalknives.com with uh, you know. And then they told the story of Cooper Cutlery, and Cooper was doing yeah. knives. I bought a weed knife. Uh, it's got the marijuana oh, yeah, leaf yeah, on, yeah. on the on the scales, but yeah. it was a big ass folder. One of my buddies up in um, up near Jacksonville, uh, he got one, and it was big blade. And I go, dude, Tony, where'd you get that? And he goes, oh, I got it over at the traditional knives, but they only have a few because they were just tuning up the machinery they got that they bought from what the old queen cutlery queen? stuff yeah. over in Pennsylvania. 
but it would they he the guy wanted to start up right there where it was and they wouldn't let him GECs over in that area uh, and some other and they go I think we got enough I don't know what was going on in the background or they were you know but they said you can buy the equipment and stuff but God be with you and go somewhere else yeah. so he took it back to Ohio and I, you know he's doing knives there although I'm not seeing a lot of stuff coming out from him yeah. so I hope he does because I think those are classic you know yeah, I, I love that. I love seeing um, the not not only the real modern materials and manufacturing of like the Jack Wolf knives, which are outstanding, but I love yeah. the uh, I I like it when when companies do it the old fashioned way too. Uh, case to some extent, GEC definitely. Um, yeah, that's probably I think Bradford, PA. That's where GEC is, or that's where um, Case is, and I think GEC is close. Yeah, uh, yeah, so it's probably yeah. Like, mm. <laughs> yeah, and so I I like those, and I don't mind ten ninety five steel that kind of oh, thing. Yeah. I don't mind. Love it's it. a high carbon steel. You can sharpen it up. Okay, it's it's definitely not stainless, but they make some stainless stuff as well. Um, but I mean, it doesn't have to be like M three ninety or S ninety V or something like that on a slip joint for me. But uh, so. You know, well, what's the process? Um, what's the process if I want to a buy a knife from you or b sell knives with you? I know a lot of collectors who listen to this show. We talk about where where should I sell? Where should I sell? So if someone wants to uh, engage one way or the other with LoveThemKnives.com, what's how do they do that? Um, they usually go to the top of the page and it says sell your knife and you can click on there and it basically just gives you my contact information. You can email me either through the site or you can, uh, or you can just email me at love them knives, uh, at gmail.com. But yeah, I want to sell a knife. And, and so they do. And so then I have a pre, uh, printed, thing that tells them the whole thing basically i want to end up with 10 percent. Mm -hmm. okay that's it but the other fees are out there too i mean obviously these and mastercard and everybody else gets their fee the website charges me like two percent I, I think three percent credit card one percent for the website so it's like four percent that's somebody got to eat that and then the shipping to the guy that buys it because yeah. I provide free shipping. So it's free shipping because I didn't want to have to match up to all the shipping services and calculate weights of everything. So yeah. they and charge them shipping. And a lot of sites offer free shipping like White Mountain Knives and stuff. So, you know, I decided now USA only. But uh, yeah, so if you sell a knife and you want to sell a knife for like 300 bucks, I get 10% and then you got to pay the six bucks it costs to ship it plus whatever 4% of 300. What's that? 12 bucks for credit card fees and shit. And that's it. Then you get the rest of the money. That's so awesome. it's not 25%. It's not, you know, whatever, all that. I mean, if you sell on eBay, it's 10%. Plus they take taxes out. So that's almost another 10%. Plus then you, you know, you got to pay the shipping if you offer free shipping or you got to charge the, the buyer and you got to consider that the price of the knife uh, and that kind of thing. So um, yeah. And then you don't get paid directly, right? Cause eBay collects the money and you've got to have a linked account and then they transfer it to you. It's not the old days with PayPal kind of stuff anymore so i mean so the secondary market though there's other sites where you can buy a knife and you can go to the facebook groups trade you can go to reddit you can go to all these different places and do that so god be with you if you can do that i probably cater to the older guys that are less techie yeah. and the lazy guys which there's a lot of them like me so well, they, they you put a you shitload of knives in a box and ship it to me with yeah, a list. That'll and be they me go, too. Go do it. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't want to take all the pictures and put them on the sites and 
I'm I respond you, to buyers and pack it up and do all that shit. You're doing a great <laughs> service. Uh, seriously, for the because I don't want to do all that stuff either. Um, so how how do you assure uh, buyers on the site of the quality of the knife they're going to get? Uh, I just try. First of all, the person that sends the knives in to sell, I I ask them to tell me of any known defects or issues or scratches or you know whatever. Maybe it's got a left hand pocket clip, but that's missing, or it doesn't have a box or whatever. Gotcha. I want to know that because I want to disclose that in the description. I try and take really good pictures that they can click on and blow up and look yeah. very carefully at because I do have a disclaimer on there saying, you know, look at the pictures and the pictures will show you pretty much the condition and the description should disclose that as well. So, you know, yeah. um, so I, I, you know, other than that, I do not do a 10 X, inspection of every knife that comes through i generally look at them like i look at most knives that right. i get and i go i mean i don't see anything that jumps out at me it locks up good no blade play centered you know blah 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 i don't see any scratches or whatever but yeah i mean they're pre-owned right so well, I, I was just going to assume because of your connoisseurship and your love of knives uh, you have to open everyone, handle everyone, and take I pictures did. of everyone. So, so that's that in a way is is an inspection right there. Um, I, I it's from... it's a learning experience too. There's a lot of knives coming through here. It's like I didn't even know this knife existed. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. I wish it never did. Oh, <laughs> oh my god. Funny. There's some. It's like. I don't understand the mind of the person that bought this. And I guess yeah. maybe I do now because they want to sell it. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, born to there's sell. There's some cherries and then there's some others in there. Then I'm going, God, who the hell designed that thing? And who the hell was crazy enough to buy it? All right, Lee, as as we wrap up here, I, I, I like to um, do a speed round with everyone who, like yourself, uh, has a million knives coming across their desk. They evaluate knives, they review knives, and it's just a uh, a one or the other sort of speed round. So I have some questions here. I don't want you to think too hard about them. Just just answer what comes to mind. Okay. Okay. Speed round engaged. Okay. Fixed or folder. Folder. Flipper or thumb stud. Hmm. Um. I, I'm I'm good with thumb studs, to tell you the truth. Washers or bearings? Bearings. Tip up or tip down? Tip up. Tonto or Bowie? Bowie. Hollow ground or flat ground? Ooh. I, but I'd say flat ground is the most, yeah, for me. But that hollow's good. Full size or small? I'm kind of a full size guy, yeah. yeah. yeah me too. <laughs> knife uh, guy. <laughs> okay. Gentleman's knife or tactical? Tactical. Automatic or bally song? Neither. <laughs> Gotta pick one. Uh, automatic then. Okay. Button lock or bar lock? Uh I like the button locks. So far, ben Benchmade or Spyderco? Spyderco. M390 or 20CV? It's the same thing. Okay. 20CV or Kubi? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tucson or Kubi? Um, woo. Wow. They both make... I, I guess I default to Tucson. Interesting design. It's really interesting. Carbon fiber or micarta? Carbon fiber, definitely. Finger choil or no choil? Finger choil. Form or function? Form. Me too. Few Design. Of us, few of us will admit it, but me too. And finally, your desert island knife. One knife that you get to keep from your collection 
for the rest of your life. Wow. That's a good question. Um, that'd be forever. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm awful fond of my, uh, my Manix 2 XL natural G10 with an M4 blade. It was a blade HQ exclusive. It's just, I've never been able to walk away from that. It's definitely a full size knife, but if I'm on an ocean desert Island, it's definitely going to be the salt <laughs> Good LC 200 N baby. Cause this will never rust. No nitrogen. Rust. Nitrogen, no carbon for me. Man, Lee, I was going to say you have an easy out for that question. You could say, well, clearly it's the result. Uh, but yeah, you know, and I, I was I, I, that was going to be my natural response, but then I go, that's too, yeah, yeah. too, yeah. I, too well, I, I, I love your response. I, uh, the M4 is an amazing steel, the, the Manix 2XL, great knife, and I love the, the way those, uh, those blade hq exclusives look hey lee thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast i appreciate you joining us and uh, uh i really look forward to taking advantage of the services you provide to those of us who are lazy <laughs> about selling knives uh, yeah. remind remind bring everyone it on. bring remind, it on remind everyone where to go to to check you out and to check out the website Yes, yes, lovethemknives.com. You don't have to go to Dutch, Spotify, blah, 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 although you can put that actual link down. But, I mean, uh, you just luvthemknives.com will redirect you right to that website. All right. Thanks very much, Lee. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Bob. It's my pleasure, man. Take care. The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, LTK, still making videos uh, as he does this website. So make sure you check out his uh, YouTube channel, his uh, Instagram, as well as lovethemknives.com. Again, I know I'm, you'll, you'll be seeing some Knife Junkie knives eventually on that website. All right. Uh, be sure to join us here next Sunday for another conversation with a great knife person wednesday for the midweek supplemental and don't forget thursday night knives 10 p.m eastern standard time right here on youtube facebook and twitch for jim working his magic behind the switcher i'm bob demarco saying until next time don't take dull for an answer thanks for listening to the knife junkie podcast if you enjoyed the show please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com for show notes for today's episode additional resources and to listen to past episodes visit our website theknifejunkie.com you can also watch our latest videos on youtube at theknifejunkie.com slash youtube check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash instagram and join our facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash facebook and if you have a question or comment Email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487. And you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.